Uh, so welcome to the Splice Poetry Series. This is our second installment. We had one in January for the first time. This is our second one. We got Rodrigo Toscano with us today and Rob Fitterman as well, who are going to read us some bad motherfucking poems. And I'd also like to promote uh, litwire.org. If you ever want to know where literary events are going on in the city, please go to litwire.org. Please also submit your events to litwire.org so that we can put them up on the calendar. Without the community, it would not work. So when you send some stuff in, we'll pop it up there and everybody in the city can see it. Come on in, get comfortable. All right, let's talk about Rodrigo a little bit. Let's warm him up, get him a little heated here. Rodrigo's poems antagonize. They antagonize ideologies, intellects, signs, and simulacra. If you're not ready to have your positions poked and shoved toward a sharper comprehension of what they are and why, you might never arrive at the joyous revelations offered in his poems. Offered against the global scamming and hucksterism, the new terrors of everyday life. His poems aren't just here to tell you how bad shit is. Rodrigo's poems splash a spectral materialism in our faces that refreshes our scrutiny into and out of how we think about what we think and what we actually do in the real world. Our Adorain calls the poems in The Charm and the Dread, his new book over here for sale for 10 bucks. She calls the poems in his new book Post-Border, Post-Left, and Post-Bullshit Utopia. She's right, but his poems are not totally concerned with simple left and right politics or pre and post poetics. The poems offer a more complicated ideological dimensionality. They are under and over wings of politics. They are inside and outside of temporal poetics and they are now and historical simultaneously. These poems that Rodrigo will read us are human. They are definitely aware that some of us can forget that we all live in a city together, that we are not separate. Rodrigo Toscano is a poet and essayist based in New Orleans. He is the author of 10 books of poetry. His latest book, The Charm and the Dread, out by Fence Books this year, available here for 10 bucks or from him for 10 bucks. His previous books include In Range, Explosion Rocks Springfield, Deck of Deeds, Collapsible Poetics Theater, which is a national poetry series selection, Two Leveling Swerve, Platform Partisans, and The Disparities. His poetry has appeared in over 20 anthologies, including Best American Poetry and Best American Experimental Poetry. Toscano has received a New York State Fellowship in Poetry. He won the Edwin Markham 2019 Prize for Poetry. He works for the Labor Institute in conjunction with the United Steelworkers, the National Institute for Environmental Health Science, Communication Workers of America, National Day Laborers Organizing Network, and the Northwest Tribes doing educational training projects that involve environmental and labor justice, health and safety, culture transformation. Check out his deep cuts on RodrigoToscano.com and please welcome to the stage, Rodrigo Toscano. All right, uh, great to be here. Uh, one of my oldest friends, Rob Fitterman, I'm very happy to be reading with him. And Welcome everybody to the Splice Reading Series, which I am. I am also a co-curator. Co I'm going to be uh, reading from um, <clears throat> the two collections, the one that just came out, uh, The Charm and the Dread, and also from this uh, new, new book that's also on the way called The Cut Point. Songsters. How did people procreate around these parts? 50 years ago? Under what conditions 100 years ago? By what constraints and liber liberties 200 years ago? To what ends, with what means 400 years ago? What rituals impelled? What songs propelled 800 years ago? What songs were deemed fit and by whom 1600 years ago? Songsters back at camp sampling, other camps compressing, and fitting old songs to new times 3,200 years ago. Call it quits on rituals, rituals purpose, till a direction, a journey, 
is divine. 6,400 years ago, songsters vying, who's shiny, who's not? 12,800 years ago, vanguards in tatters, retrofitted, jimmied, just enough to make relevance. Write the city. What's the point of New York City? Or for that matter, Calgary, or any city on a hill, or hidden far beneath the waves, any city at any time, any city planned or dreamt of? What's the point of males and females? What's the rub with transportation, movement of foodstuffs or the arts, distribution of new pleasures, or the same old ones year by year, making for a steady story? What's the point of stock characters, emotions bundled or spread out, arguments over arguments, escapes from argumentation, fantastical propositions, promises to extend a hand? What's the point of scheduling things all in tandem or at random through avenues, streets, and alleys, secret, secreted forever, or spilled onto morning pavement, draining into holes, seaward bound? What's the point of that lingerie that ties length and width and color, fraying from overuse or disuse, weighing X amount per square ton, legs, rubber arms, cotton, eyes, Steel, what point in writing the city? Magnolias. This shade casting magnolias getting involved with your breathing, or is it better put, was always involved with your breathing. This shade-casting magnolia is oblivious to poetic encirclement, or is it better put, becoming aware of escape routes. You're reading about colonialism again? You're writing about material entanglement? You're vocalizing empire's crack-up again? Shaded and shading magnolias, maybe like 20 after hard rain, make a point at midday. The sun quacking on about technique. This not being Kabul, this being Kabul after all. Radiated, global, new grammar. Magnolias, moist and steamy, vanishing from the scene, poof. That is, dragooned to the task and hating it. Endless summer NOLA. The, pair, the unpaired, or paired, or semi-paired, or multiply paired, and pestilence. She willed herself into a crush, self-gathering crush. Totality makes purpose. By and by, good tidings. By and by, the rough passage. Sick of the city and praising it. Fatigued by the country, proofing it up. He, what did he do? What he was he, how hardy a he hereabouts, how? Pinging magnolia, pinging chydrangia. They preferred pewter flower rings. Random rain again, blinky twice. Random rain again, blinky thrice. Boats and planes, cars and trains, forehead on forehead, booty to booty. She, what did she do? What she was she? How hardy is she hereabouts? How? Singing is elsewhere. Dancing is elsewhere. The verified maminoles hereabouts. They willed themselves out of Frolicking. They willed themselves into frolicking. This splish splash, puddle ocean, shimmery, glowy, red new sun. Oh, the crush that never cometh. Oh, 
the crush that suffocated. He became an ignorant gardener. She became a questionable baker. They saw the lights funk out all at once. They flashed up. Purpose was waiting on the corner. The corner came into question. By and by, wild prophecies. By and by, drink cups cuddling. Again, the paired, unpaired, semi-paired, multiply paired, and pestilence. Here's uh, two, two sonnets. Full haunt. He just keeps writing Taiwan in pencil over and over. And after some time, Ukraine over and over. No phrases, let alone a discernible sentence. Maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. Some power wanting it like that. Full haunt. Possession by proper nouns at the start. And then later, automatic actions by the body linked to other bodies, near and far, their nouns for the day, full haunt. So goes this minimalist theater, staged by news cycles, acted by pencils. So goes the arms industrial complex, amassing armies, navies, chintzy lines. Phoebus Apollo wants to write a piece called Lithium Girls, at around midday, gulf breezes humming, globes of water vapor rolling eastward, sporadic blasting sun, droplets plashing, a mighty fine way to spend a Monday, musing on carbon boys, growing older, somewhat wiser, somehow preserving clues, ciphers for lithium girls to decode at dawn, dense fog, rolling up the bayou, green, still shimmering waters reflecting moon. Why girls? Why boys? Why anyone at all? Silicone, laminate, undies aside. What's their poetic foreign policy, these bards, on a Friday nearing midnight? Orpheus of Pensacola. Are Tercet's imperialist thugs? Now that the price of dicks has dropped, robotics minor, poetrics. Shejitron swaps out 80 brains. One ton of MAGA flags docking. This listing skip festooned in flack. Do octosyllabics repress? Dredge up Dr. Salubrico. Biometrics minor, friction. Detecting debtor Joe's a cinch. 20 tons of dildos docking. Be fireball flecks of carbonite. Is description homicidal? Ask what dick brains go for these days. Genomics minor, non-friction. Tweaking no tan, Tammy's a hoot. 50 tons of bang dolls docking, swirl jolly in the anarchy. The cut point. The trash men do come, and that's a miracle, on top of the marvel of home water heaters and central air cooling. Your whole life is brained up by designs of others, alongside others, executing plans. This density of intentions is the world you navigate, even in sleep. There's a grand rebellion against this world, taking many forms. One such one is lyric poetry. These failed rebellions deepen the myths we tell ourselves about ourselves in kooky ways. Why has everything become rejoinders? Rejoinder and rejoinder, this ceaseless, chatty inflation. The trashmen know the cut point. AC repair crews know the cut point. Some poets, maybe. 
The density is we, the needle to cloth is we, and surely the rivet to plate is zuon politicon. The likes and follows do come dressed as miracles, vaguely intentional, fizzling fast. Behold is an old word meant to behold, what's behold to something, say this tub faucet. The density of intention here calls up legions of poetic actors pushing limits. The water that flows is a cut point, the pipes that held it are cut points, the dam, the dials. But what about clouds? Have we rebelled against wily whisperings? Are clouds merely constructivisms? No matter. The trash men have arrived on top of the marble of a number two pencil tracking the point. Two, two sonnets, robes. Those robes, you say, are not your robes, per se. Okay, the world is robes, disrobing robes on display in a sacred, naked way. Fervent offerings, emphasis on play, opposed to a whole robe, as it were, with belt. Belts these days are fully detachable, but tangle up, too, in a dreadful way. Then there's the half robe with trims and tassels, full fray, bare ass by moonlight, a new robe, overspent robes, as it were, disrobing in chambers, open chambers, closed chambers. There's chambers we know, too, behind chambers, below those chambers, who knows? More robes, perhaps naked hangers, party till dawn. <laughs> Phantasmic sage. Forced political poems are poison. This is what he said, to which we all agreed. By force, we mean cramming in emotions, smothering allusions to I was there, he said, as we concealed our rolling eyes. And if they were there, they guarantee that they were elsewhere. Is that how that works? He said, recapturing our attention. And it's those elsewheres all stitched into one impossible task that makes for foresight, he said, leaving us confused and prickly. People cherish the gaps in poetry, the politicals a swan deep in the gaps, he said, inscrutably, shooting the gaps. Betimes, a, a rhapsody for activists. Betimes, you stall, and by stalling, rock it. Betimes, you're a dead board worker. Betimes, a devoted worker without deep purpose. Betimes, you're a thrill-seeking slacker. Betimes, a genius co-worker without peers. You chose this. You chose dialectical rec sensational. You pounce towards direct and tense unknown. You've sloughed off crooked dick nationalism. You've blown up indolence on some occasions eloquence. Who can Velcro on a plasticized red wig when you want it? Who can supply you a bronze lion future beast of victory? Betimes, you're a pre-pounce poet posing as pounce, or betimes, you're a post-pounce as twitchy twitch. Not whatever, never whatever, but this. You're a spectral socialist savage. You're a spectral socialist civilizer. You're a spectral socialist dirt clod on diamond. Who can futurize the people without a trademark? Who enacts fire canister hierarchical reform? Betimes you carouse, and by carousing, arouse. Betimes you're a hell, as y'all say, cat with hiss and claws. Betimes you're a devotee to love slamming you to the ground. Did you really choose this gem? Art thou chosen? Are you descending now towards free-floating domes in the sky? Have you handily sloughed off sultry stance nationalisms? Betimes, nationalism offer services left or right. Betimes, intranationalisms show a way out for a fee. Who can spatialize the people without coordinates? Who enacts supersymmetrical justice reform? You're a spectral socialist, bit actor. You're a spectral socialist, stunt double. 
You're a spectral socialist, diamond fleck on demon dung. Betimes, you rocket, and by rocketing, stall. Betimes, you stall, and by stalling, rocket. Uh, the, the word Mannerbund uh, in, in German is, is men's club. And uh, in the Weimar period, before the, the Nazi took over, there was these, these uh, men's club that little by little the, the National Socialists took over. But it generally sort of just means man's club, men's, you know, homo social kind of deal. Mannerbunda. Guns, shedfuls of them, you'll see will not be the deciding factor in the big shift towards hemispheric autarky. No amount of rounds and clips, no hoarded and safe, will rewrite labor laws that integrate Canadian, American, and Mexican biopower around a vision of itself, protective economically, expansive culturally, interposed maps of watersheds, routes of produce, conduits of clean energy, lasered in on healthy work and stable housing. The big shift doesn't require belly crawling, sharpshooters, grown boy camps, manor bunda, sing-alongs pining after dreams of becoming sovereign when all's entangled already, except not formally and equitably, set to a higher order, resource conscious, confident future, commandeering, hemispheres, collective wealth, material and psychic, brave projection, bulwark against this anarcho-tyranny, faux nationalism, yacht excursion for winners of rigged outcomes, swamp monsters becoming great again, promoting shedfuls of ammo, camo, grown-up boy lingerie, boudoir, manor bunda, posing on towering trucks, performing sovereign wins, all's entangled already, but on a wobbly base with sideshows, gunshows, crouching, cowering, last gasps of sovereign kings, every man a serf, owning nothing, not mineral deposits, not beds of technology, nor downstream planning, educational cargo, material and psychic, oblivious to rising forces, integrated, autarkic, prosperous, homelands to thrive in where crotch, grasping, gun-toting, enfeebled copes flicker out year by year as hemispheric power looks outward with straight backs towards other autarkic regions, working on integration of a higher order, of a higher order, looking outwards, mindfully negotiating globes, collective wealth material, and psychic, and yeah, a few museums of nation states, and even kinky cosplay might be entertaining on occasion, to remind us of the age of anarcho-tyranny and its camo lingerie butlers on a leash, manor bunda. Uh, two sonnets, Insur insurrectionary, the day-to-day -day existence of people, if that doesn't change, then what is all this? These protests, these stances, rage, pieties, passionate words, eloquent poetry, what's the use of any of it today, tomorrow and many days to come, aren't shaped differently, aren't lived differently, which calls the question, what do people want? What do they want? Not just what they don't want. Let's list it. Let's study the list closely. And before these items are pinned to life, let's have that conversation. What is life? What kinds of life forms are we? All of us. And what's best for each and everyone here? Flesh. It's imperative we keep flesh intact. We don't want perforations, abrasions, or undue irritations marring it. We also want to guard coloration of whatever hue hones to its nature. Smallest capillaries must breathe free. When a breeze fans it, we love the perk up. When flesh grazes it, we love the perk up, the heat or cold of curiosity. It's imperative we keep flesh intact. Painters, if they make the comeback, might plumb flesh, flush out commonality. Poets, if they ever make the comeback, might suture flesh restore integrity. Uh, brown lives. 
Brown lives, the phrase, as is, don't matter in Mexico. The shades are endless. Where draw the line? You'd go quite mad. What matters in Mexico is lana, cold cash, how much, how far the flow, what things, what folks you gather around you. Of course, colorism thrives in Mexico, weighs in, tip scales. But saying and insisting brown lives, the phrase as is, is sacred, is blurry, happy talk won't supply the flow, the things, the folks you gather around you, the line when drawn would shift nearly monthly. The haggle would matter to oligarchs a lot. The haggle would matter to academia even more. Brown lives, whole departments might thrive. Service lines, blurring oligarchs, long game. Still though, colorism thrives in Mexico. It hurts, it works for some, for sure. Some families have winners and losers. It's important to confront colorism, frankly. But Lana, go see, take in, don't flinch, draws lines on top, down, below, both sides, makes box. In Mexico, boxes matter, not lines that shift weekly, daily. You'd go quite mad, demarking where, jumping back, jumping over, buying to, dragging shit, here to there and back, stuck in a box in Mexico, decaled with brown lives, matter merch, donated by happy oligarchs of oil, of telecom, of finance, beachfront empires, foreground to hillside slums, background to nervous middlings, frozen between undecided about lines, boxes, which matter and why, earning zeal, spending zeal to audit Mexico lindo is necessary. The peso plunging today. 10%. The revolution. Gray birds made of marble falling from the sky. Swamp oaks taking two steps forward if you look closely. Levee water levels rising exactly by four feet. New bridges made of glass suddenly appear over urban canals. Storefront signages swapping places, making sense. Girls with brown eyes rolling boulders into pyramids of gold. Girls with blue eyes casting steel hooks onto silver gates. Girls with green eyes forming a field of grass to skip on. Red chromed out chopper crossing the streets, no rider. Purple sun painting 12 windows onto a local birthing center. Hell, the word, the concept, scary no children at this hour. Heaven, the word, the concept, wood cube and dank attic, rotting. Two minute clip of brawny man battling an alligator in loop mode. One minute clip of young boy twirling brawny man in loop mode. Sundown western breeze fanning ice tower evaporations. Blank stare of a statue on an iron barge seaward bound. Bats across a full moon portrait in a trash bin flaming. Canoe made of pure sugar gliding over asphalt streets at midnight. 30 second clip of diamond tooth baby in loop mode. Bayou bugs onto fourth generation since yesterday morning. Yellow birds made of polyurethane come to a consensus. 15 second clip of upside down city skyline. Justice, the word vision in an orange cloud descending, glowing. Seven and a half second clip of pencil frolicking on white paper. 400 foot mound of multicolored masks and panties toppling. Deceased couple with brass canes crossing glass bridge at dawn. Traffic barricades napping again, if you take a glance. The land. The land is our friend. That's it, take, take two. The land is ours. Not bad. Take three. The land we love. Well done. Take four. The land 
loves us. Excellent. Take five. The land speaks English. Whoa. Repeat, take five. The land speaks Chirimacha. Whoa. Repeat, repeat, take five. The land doesn't care. That's more like take six. The land is the lands. Bingo. Take seven. The land wants the sea. What? Repeat, take seven. The land swims to sea. Perfect. Take eight. The land floats in space. Weird, but it's a wrap. Tank tankards between palms. And palms come into view. Fair enough place to start. Sensuous is seaside piss. Epic is Xi Jinping. Yes, this scene works all three. The palms whiz Chairman Xi. Proceed with weaving palms, twirling to western wind. Next, the piddle puddle, proudly, pooling, seeping. Xi Jinping now awakes, signs edicts, tracks results. Wait, two tankards in view. One glides in, one streams out. One half full, one half void. Salutes, superfluous. Orange sun sliced in half, effulgent gray halo. Between the palms, tinkling on the black sun, dwelling. This one's called uh, The Left and the Right. That, that, that. What? That, that, that. What? Ours, ours, ours. Mine, mine, mine. Ours, ours, ours. Mine, mine, mine. Leap, leap, leap. Chill out. Leap, leap, leap. Chill out. You can't, oh, can't we? You can't, oh, can't we? This too, this too. That's not. This too, this too. That, that, that's not. For the love of, for the love of, for the love of, for the love of. Hands up. Take my rocker. Hands up. Take my rocker. Rock and rollin'. Freeze. Rock and rollin'. Freeze. It's about the children. It's about the children. It's about the children. It's about the children. <laughs> Cruising, jamming, or he's a bitch. Ass, in fact, is death. The return of Abba is death in beautiful increments. Kittens grow, leaf twigs snap. Now the moon hovers above, tease. A sort of ass in space, no help from moonlight in birth, wars, and wooing. There was a blonde, right? And a brunette, right? And two kittens and pantsuits. Make that four, plus the invisible drummer. And 70 asses swaying, a totten tance by the millions. Ass, in fact, is life. The return of ABBA is, well, for the half-dead, in beautiful increments. 15-inch tires, 30-inch tires, by the moon or sun, grinding, wearing, thinning, dusting the roads. Tires oblivious to car frames, car frames toting asses. 2020s models or styles or makes. A totten tance. Do you have to look that up? Really? One tired, driving for the unstudious. And I, I'm, I'm just going to finish up here with four, four sonnets. The first one is called An American Sonnet. Best remove your watch before the first line. Before the second, consider China, the magnitude of the transformation. 
Every nook and cranny of your life, carousels of markets, spin off effects. Now on the sixth line, ponder the demos. We say remove the watch as time collapsed, just as you sprung forward to Zion. So on the ninth line, revise the demos, like Thomas Paine, way commons to powers. Pardon me, which way towards democracy? When it's coupled to this oligarchy. And at the 13th hour, braced for fractions, clown cars of identity crazed factions. Freedom. The last day of freedoms this very day. The last day of freedoms going fast. The last purchase, frankly, we felt quite ganked. The first day of freedom, madam, behold. The first day of freedom, sir, is closing. The first day of freedom was a rager. This second day, frankly, I don't know, man. This third day is starting to really pop. Fourth days of freedom, humble the humless. That fifth day over there, what's the monthly? Now that we're uh, living the sixth day here, it seems to us the seventh day is an eighth. On the ninth day of freedom, my true one, this tenth day of freedom, dodging zero. Two more, and that's it. Uh, this this uh, two sonnets are one. This is whittlers, maybe just a whittler humanity, playing cards, zipping to Mars, calculus, making plans for the holiday, humming, reviving the half dead, improving beer, limping along in old seminaries, repairing faith's cracks, upkeeping the look of everything in sight or imagined. A grand fugue of finagling a purpose. And then come the puppies, the kittens, the birds, of no purpose, demanding devotion. And of course, 80 million new whittlers, of which a handful will whittle away on Mars, playing chess, executing codes, extracting the last plumes of lithium. All right. This last one's called Gadget. There will be an end to this restless sea, but that time is not our time, it's the sun's. The moon's boring gray sands are part of us. We made them so, less so sunspots and flares. These timescapes interposed call for measure. You are a clock, as am I, without ticks. It's other sounds and motions assumed here that make for mirth or misery expressed, attempting to express, mostly rebuffed. Your phone is a rebuff aggregator. Earth skimming bipeds of all persuasions love this greedy clock's demands, tick by tick. Billions of would-be poems go dark there, eons before boiling seas vaporize. Thanks, everybody. Keep it going one more time for Rodrigo Toscano, everybody. And give yourselves a hand for coming out. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for coming to Splice tonight. It is my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce our next reader in town all the way from New York City. Um, I was thinking, there's got to be some sort of joke out there where a Luddite tries to map quest their way to someone's broken heart. So I googled it and there isn't, so I tried it myself. And if you do try to do such a thing, map quest instead uh, of rejecting you outright asks a couple of important questions. Where are you starting, and where are you going? Uh, a sort of allegorical anecdotal metaphor is often used to describe the notion of infinite regress, which is basically where if you try to justify one thing, you have to justify the justification of that thing, then justify the justification of that thing, so on and so forth. It's an image of an ancient turtle holding the world on its back. Beneath that turtle, a larger turtle. Beneath that one, another. It's turtles all the way down, they say. 
uh, universal sprawl, we might say. At least those turtles know the way down. Our Luddite is still scratching their head how to get to the heart of it all. Robert Fitterman is going to read from a book-length poem called Creve Corps. It's named for a little suburban city outside of St. Louis, Missouri. It's where he grew up, where he was born. It comes for the French broken heart. It's all pretty romantic, I guess. A town peopled by power walkers and grocery baggers. Oh, and also a poisonous chemical firm and racist white denizens who don't want black people to live in their neighborhoods who, like dregs in a 1950s decanter, aged like a fine wine. And by that I mean so far aged it's gone corked long, long ago before the grape even grew on the vine. Rob's poem uncorks these suburban genies who have self-served nothing but their own wishful systems. In its search, in its research, this poem drives the idea that Quote, sadness is not the same as suffering. How much longer are we to justify the lazy, sleepy-eyed frameworks in which we view the light of the world? Roka said, you must change your life. Then James Wright famously doctored it to, I have wasted my life. Somebody fact check me on this, but I believe that poem takes place in a modest ranch home in Creep Court. <laughs> it's not as far away as you think. You actually uh, just go down St. Claude to 610 West, and then I'll turn into 10, and stay on that for about 20 miles, then hop on to 55 North alongside the Mississippi, then about 500 miles, go to 270, take that and get off at Olive. It's not that complicated, these broken hearts. Hop in his car, Rob will show you. It's Creve Coors all the way up. Where we're going, it's Creve Coors all the way up. Where we're going, found language can get lost again. Oh, look, there's a turtle just floating there at the edge of Creve Lake. Robert Fitterman is the author of 14 books of poetry, including Rob's Word Shot. This window makes me feel. Never mind. No, wait, yep, definitely still hate myself. Now we are friends. Rob the Plagiarist, War the Musical, and Metropolis, a long poem in four separate volumes. He's collaborated with several visual artists, including Sirkan Ozukaya, Sabine Herman, Nayland Blake, Natalie Check, Tim Davis, and Klaus Kilich. Also, he is the founding member of the Artist Poets Collective, Collective Task. He teaches writing and poetry at New York University. Everybody, please give a warm welcome for Robert Fetterman. Thank you. Oh my God, that was so nice. Uh, the one thing Henry didn't mention is that he too is from this town called Creve Cor, which is insane um, that he is um, a brother from another mother. Um, thank you all for being here. I, I, I mean, thanks for having me. It's a kind of amazing to be uh, um, performing a live poetry reading. It's been a crazy absence during COVID. Um, yeah, and thank you, uh, Sean, Henry, and Rodrigo for having this series. Rodrigo is my friend for 30 years. We met when we were 10. And uh, it's like a crazy amount of time. Um, so yeah, as Henry said, I'm gonna be um, reading from a long poem that I'm in the middle of working on called Creed Core. Uh, dear Dr. William Carlos Williams, I just want to let you know that I've been a big fan of your poetry ever since I started writing. So, what we have here is a recasting of your long poem, Patterson. Where you, say, where you use a uh, North Jersey hard scrabble town in mid-century America, I'm mirroring with a late 20th century Midwestern suburb called Creve Coeur. It's my hometown. I'm mirroring your form quite a lot, and I'm mirroring your content a little bit. So, especially this mix of poetry with archival news, stories, and place is a big part of what I'm up to. 
So anyway, I just wanted to say thanks to Dr. Williams for producing Patterson, all five books, 20, 200 plus pages. You're killing me. Yours truly, Rob. Creve Court, a preface. Beauty is no thing. Creve Court, something like broken heart from the French, my hometown, a sleepy suburb of St. Louis. Pocahontas is the seventh member of the Disney princess lineup. In short, the movie is about how shipwrecked British settlers land in the New World and meet the enchanting Pocahontas. One of the young, handsome settlers, Mel Gibson's voice, falls hopelessly in love with the beautiful Pocahontas. A nightmare occurs, and the lovers seek out the advice of Grandmother Willow, a spiritual talking tree. After some disputes and violence, the dashing white settler hero has to return to England, and the lovers are both left brokenhearted. In the final scene, Pocahontas waves goodbye to the ship from the top of a jagged cliff. This is basically the story of how my hometown, Creve Corps, got its name. Except this story, between a French fur trapper and an Osage woman, ends in suicide. Also in the Creve Corps story, when the heartbroken woman leapt to her death off the waterfall and into the Creve Corps lake, the body of water then formed a broken heart. Hmm, grunts the face of the falls as a slow trickle drips down the limestone ledge like the steps of the Euthena Roman amphitheater slick with the green scum of some vague Missouri earth. Without much thought, the Creve Corps waterfall, sometimes called Dripping Springs, is for lovers. But this waterfall is not very steep. It never seemed ideal to me, or even possible, for a suicide, lovesick, or otherwise. Power walking changes lives. The best way to describe power walking is to think of it as a low impact alternative to jogging. Basically, it takes regular walking and ups the intensity. If you put two walkers next to each other and told one to move at a moderate pace with their arms at their side and told the other to increase their speed while simultaneously pumping their arms, that's the technique. But who is this creep core walker powering down the sidewalk at dusk? Swoosh is the sound of his polycotton tracksuit, also called tip fleece, a deep burgundy offset nicely by his out-of-the-box white Reeboks. Around the Monsanto, uh, Monsanto campus he goes, endless loops of service roads and laboratories, and onto the Schnucks sidewalk, past McDonald's, and on down to Ledoux Road, heading west past the Haves, whose futures look bright, and then powering on by some neglected 70s condo units where two grown-ass men are enjoying a front patio lounge, blue Bud Light koozies. Life is sweet, reads one t-shirt. I hate everything, reads the other. <laughs> Likely from the George Strait song, A Kind of Consolation Prize. Book one, Schnucks, a giant among supermarkets. This is why I don't do self-checkout. I was at Schnucks with my dad and he was overcharged for like two out of 10 things. This happens almost every time we do check out. Dad is a rock, somewhat hard of hearing, occasionally stubborn, so I get it when he insists on using self-checkout, but then I'm the one who has to stand in line at customer service and unload everything onto the counter. Ragu was three for five. Dad got three and was charged for four. Chicken sausages were buy one, get one free. Dad got four and was charged for four. It's embarrassing, and on top of everything else, Dad bought a bad batch of cut flowers and since it wasn't on his Schnucks rewards card, they made him jump through hoops to exchange it. My dad's a sweet guy, but highly principled and if crossed, he's known to slam a bouquet of chrysanthemums onto the counter. But everything else 
unaroused. Say it, no ideas at all. Nothing but the blank faces at the checkout. Once upon a time I worked at this creep core store and once when I was out back for a cigarette break, I set free a shiny gold helium balloon trapped behind a dumpster. In bubbly cursive it read, best day ever. Back then there was a manager, Zach, who'd intentionally hide, cra hide trash in corners to see if I was sweeping properly. Hmm, I think you missed this area. <laughs> Zach used to boast that he's worked in nearly every schnook's location, either helping out or training new hires. He claimed he wasn't prejudiced and that the stores in North County, like in Ferguson or Florissant, just weren't as up to speed as the ones in West County. He said that nearly every store had horrible deli departments and he would tell horror stories like when deli meats were dropped on the floor and then wiped off because the butchers didn't feel like cutting anymore. Everything depended, Zach said, on the neighborhood. A few years back, I helped my parents move out of their small suburban house with a yard in Creve Coeur and into a small retirement apartment building. The concept of the doggy poop bag for their Karen Terrier had to be introduced. I offered to go to Schnucks. It was at least 100 degrees. No breeze. Mr. Brokenhearted has checked out. All of my old relatives seem to vanish in the air of their one-bedroom North St. Louis apartments. Blinds closed, steady cigar smoke, freshly ironed shirts, one proudly showing his Labor Party card, another with his tie on pushing a lawnmower. I grew up thinking brightly lit homes equal wealth. I arrive at Schnucks all maudlin and sweaty, and asked the employee pricing soup cans, where are the doggy bags? He looks at me bewildered. Takeout bags? Poop bags, I say too loudly. Oh man, pretty sure we're out. I huff back to the Camry. Arr, tiny gnats all over my face. To get there from here, less than miraculous. Quote, once you cross Del Mar, I don't know, it's a different world, end quote. The Del Mar Divide refers to Del Mar Boulevard as the dividing line running east to west across St. Louis City and County. In the early 20th century, the St. Louis real estate industry employed a system of racial covenants and steering to drive the city's growing black population to neighborhoods north of Del Mar while driving white families to the south and west. As part of FDR's New Deal, the federal government began to subsidize and incentivize home mortgages. 98% went to white homeowners in an attempt to kickstart the economy during the Great Depression. To guide the incentives, the federal government hired local squadrons of appraisers, brokers, realtors, bankers, etc. to designate areas as best, still desirable, definitely declining, or hazardous. These Areas deemed hazardous were outlined in red, giving rise to the term redlining. Suburbs like Creek Core were a direct result of this aggressive redlining. Someone posts this corrective. Actually, the lake was named Lac de Crevque, or Lake of the Broken Heart, and was named after Pierre Laclede of the Choteau family, known for setting up trading treaties with the local Native Americans for, of the fur trapping business and the newly founded village of St. Louis around 1760. Pierre Laclede and the Native American woman supposedly fell in love and the chieftain refused to allow them to marry. A story told many places about many lakes and the woman threw herself off the cliff and died. Well, it did not happen where the sign is, but north at the bluffs. Trust me, because I happen to own Madame Chateau's Bible, and it has notes in it about this event. An aerial view of the lake 
shows the crack in the heart. A golf course, a corporate park, an ice rink, and above the schnooks loading dock, above the dumpsters and the cracked asphalt, floats the shiny gold balloon, flowing long hair, whiff of weed. The other side of the balloon reads, grand opening, every new strip mall, like a new day. <clears throat> Book two, a Sunday walk in the park. Outside of Furious 7, the entire Fast and Furious franchise is just so-so. <laughs> the power walker muses as it goes over the opening scene carnage, two hospital workers huddled behind an EKG machine, an armed SWAT team slain and scattered about the hospital hallways, elevators, lobby, the sinister assassin casually walking away from the hospital, back turned to the grenade about to explode, boom, screeching away in his Jaguar F-type coupe R. The power walker shakes off the difference and strides ahead with his steady pace along the Creefcore Lake path. He hums the chorus of a Doobie Brothers tune. Talk about a disconnect. No one cares about who you are or who you say you are. They care about belonging and they care about who can accelerate that for them. And who can blame them for wanting to feel like they belong? And who, yada, yada, yada. The world is harsh and the comforts are few. The comforts. A weekend on the nature trail is my comfort, daydreams the power walker. American mink, river otter, bagel factory, woodland vole, the Global Quesadilla Club, Pine Warbler, Froyo, Meadow Jumping Mouse, Lion's Choice, Woodchuck, Pastries of Denmark, Panda Express, Combating an Unknown Death, Piecemeal. The most genteel part of this story is the namesake. Wendell O. Pruitt and William Igo, not household names, except for their association to the infamous Pruitt Igo housing project. They were chosen in part because the proposed units were to be segregated. The Wendell Pruitt homes for black residents named after the heroic black World War II military pilot and the William Igo apartments for white residents named after the Irish American congressman. The segregated proposal was de deemed illegal by the time it was constructed, uh, actually, but the project names stayed on. Many would describe Pruitt Igo as the greatest disaster in post-war public housing. After World War II, the vast population of Blake, black St. Louisans were zoned into the most depleted and uninhabitable areas of the city, especially the north side. During the 1950s, the municipal eyes of the city were looking towards tearing down the decayed north side and building an expansive housing project. Pruitt Igo was rolled out to be a modernist wonder designed by Minoru Yamasaki, later of the World Trade Center fame, 33 units of 11 stories, complete with playgrounds, gardens, and modern amenities. Pruitt Igo was in the national spotlight. Architectural form praised it as, quote, the best high apartment of the year. Pruitt Igo, however, is not famous for its modernist design or its contribution to urban renewal, but instead it is an icon for disastrous housing project failure. By the end of the 1960s, Pruitt Igo was infamous for its crime, gang violence, drug dealing, and general decay. There are many reasons to point to this failure, <clears throat> but most of them almost always include lack of government funds to maintain the buildings. Some hard materials were used due to Korean War budget restrictions. The plumbing pipes were either weather broken or frozen. Many of the units had missing windows. Elevators were commonly out of service. There was no rodent control 
and often raw sewage appeared in the hallways. The compactors were perpetually broken, so the garbage piled up in the common areas. As one former resident put it, it's just unbelievable that they would spend the money to build these things, but not the money to maintain them. The St. Louis police refused at times to even enter the complex. In 1972, less than 20 years after it had been erected, Pruitt-Igo began to be demolished. That April, the demolition of two towers was aired on TV and attracted great public interest around the world as a symbol of urban renewal gone wrong. It is an extraordinary coincidence to note that these two Yamasaki designs, Pruitt-Igo and the World Trade Center, were both exploded, toppled, and viewed around the world on TV. Mrs. Sophia M. Sachs, sitting on a log in front of the Sophia M. Sachs Butterfly House. Her hair neatly coiffed, frosted, beaming with confidence. Behind her stands the staff, from entomologists to gift shop cashiers, arranged in descending order of freshness. Somebody had to stage that St. Louis Jewish light photograph. And somebody has to wipe down the mats after each premier martial arts class. Somebody has to change the sheets and pillowcases after a bachelor party at the Drury Inn and Suite. Somebody in the kitchen at Le Bon Boucher, probably the dishwasher, has to scrape off the crusted Swiss and Gruyere cheese from the French onion soup crocks. Somebody at the Smet Jesuit High School had to inflate the basketballs during their improbable undefeated 32-0 season led by Steven Stepanovich, later of NBA fame. Somebody had to report on the Stepo scandal when he accidentally discharged a loaded firearm hitting himself in the shoulder and he initially told police that a masked intruder wearing cowboy boots and a flannel shirt broke into his apartment and shot him while screaming obscenities about basketball players. Somebody working at the cemetery has to wait in the back until the funeral service is ended. It could be a bitterly cold, rainy day before shoveling dirt onto the freshly lowered coffin. Somebody has to write about the dawn tangled in darkness. It was right after one such funeral service for my uncle Leo that we went to TGI Fridays instead of going directly to sit Shiva. I was still in high school at Parkway North, home of the Vikings, when the first TGI Fridays opened in Kareef Corps at the Westgate Mall. The place looked and smelled the same. My dad got the steak and asked for the whiskey glaze on the side. It came with the whiskey glaze on top, of course, and we were anticipating a fuss, but after a weighty pause, he proved while pushing the sauce around with his knife. I thought to myself, man, this place is really starting to show its age, and the fact that they're playing Conway Twitty's 80s hit, Somebody's Needing Somebody, didn't help move time along. <laughs> Next, my loaded cheese fry burger arrived. I ordered it at medium rare, and let's just leave it at that. <laughs> the table next to us was enjoying an oversized basket of nachos. They looked really good. I suggested we try the nachos next time. Mom and Dad looked at me like some horrible news had been delivered. <laughs> Sorry I even mentioned the, macho, the nachos and the blue raspberry lemonade was tempting no one at our table. Someone somewhere is falling asleep in a chair in front of the TV. Cross town somebody's up and walking the floor till a quarter to three. And like Conway, I'm thinking of that mythical suicide at the Creep Core Falls and that unremarkable broken-hearted lake. I'm rereading Patterson now to brush up on the framework. An interesting preposition is in play on its wiki page. 
His intent in this poem was to do for Patterson, New Jersey, what Joyce had done for Dublin in Ulysses. End quote. Are you doing Creve Core for Creve Core? Do we, its denizens, owe it something? As you tweak, say it, no ideas but in consumption. Certainly, Creve Core provides box stores, religious institutions, ball fields, yet also hides the brutal facts of general American history. Growing up, of course, the question wasn't, I wonder what happened here in the past in this place, but hey, who's got the best swimming pool? At the front of the subdivision I grew up is a massive cemetery which has changed corporate ownership so many times. I'm not sure what it's called anymore. You know the one on Mason. I've got a story for you later on down the line about that cemetery, how it changed my life for good. I can't help but to think how wild it is that we stomp these same grounds. I worked at a place called Hair Salon for Men as a shoeshine boy in between a cigar store and Licks. Pretty good custard shop, long gone now, attached to the Schnooks Shopping Center. My cousin, who would have been my age, has a memorial bench besides the Creve Coeur Lake, apparently filled with the same tears of that Osage princess. He died of a heroin overdose. I'm inclined to live this conversation we're about to have, your poetry I'm about to read, squared around our hometown. I'm traveling back there soon with my family, and given that William Cullis Williams was an avid letter writer, maybe I could find some Creek Court postcards and mail them those conversational fragments to you. Or if not, the back of a CBS receipt seems just as fitting. I mean, seriously, can you imagine my utter excitement? Can you imagine yourself circa 1980 discovering there was a poet writing explicitly and intimately about the same strip of road you're cruising down, smoking a bowl, listening to Dylan's Joey? I'm just giddy with the crosshairs of fate. How did it let us through? Our power walker picks up his pace on Craig Road and goes over his list of chores. Number one is to kill those weeds and pick up some Roundup. Who really believes those Monsanto rumors he ponders to himself about seeds, the world's food supply, cancer lawsuits? In the mid-1950s, the roofs of the pro Diego buildings in St. Louis and in nearby public schools, the army sprayed zinc cadmium sulfide via motorized blowers in order to test the dispersal patterns and the geographic range of chemical and biological weapons. At the time, local officials were told the government was testing a smoke screen that could shield St. Louis from aerial Russian attacks. Later, the US government admitted the tests were part of a biological weapons program, and St. Louis was chosen because it resembled some targeted Russian cities. One former Pruitt Igo resident recalls playing ball one day when a squadron of army planes dropped a powdery substance. She went home, cleaned up, and went back out to play. Over the years, she has battled four types of cancer, breast, skin, thyroid, and uterine. Harlan Bartholomew, urban planner whose vision was renovation by demolition. For Bartholomew, the bulldozer was the best tool for post-war urban planning. In 1939, St. Louis approved the proposal to demolish 20 square miles of inner city real estate over 400 apartment buildings and houses, mostly renters, mostly black families. And with the destruction of those homes also came the destruction of a radical bohemian culture of bookstores, jazz clubs, and coffee houses, demolishing what was once termed as the Greenwich Village of the West. To this day, massive stretches of downtown St. Louis remain scorched or poorly developed. A handful of one-story buildings, abandoned lots. Everybody has roots. We go on living. We permit ourselves, Mr. Patterson, to continue to whatever 
context is unraveling. Can we see it? Is there a right way to power walk? <laughs> Any movement, no matter what you do, is better than none. There's plenty to think about from head to toe. How your feet hit the ground, the movement of your hips, the swing of your arms, even the direction of your gaze. Around 1200 AD, the largest city north of Mexico was Cahokia, just east of St. Louis. Cahokia had a population of nearly 50,000 people, about the same size as medieval London. The city was famous for creating large earthen mounds. The construction of these mounds was so sophisticated that early white settlers invented fantastical myths about their origin. Norsemen, Hindus, even aliens were cited as the builders of the mounds. Anyone, any group that could discredit the Kohikia people as the architects of these great earthworks. The window tables at Denny's restaurant on Olive don't ordinarily offer much of the view. A couple of bushes surrounded by rocks and a small landscape strip. But around noon one, stomach, one steamy Thursday in July, two MRI lab technicians from Metro Image in West County walked in for lunch and were seated at the window table overlooking the bushes. Something caught their attention. Amid the greenery peeking out from beneath the bushes, it was a human skull. It don't matter where you bury me, I'll be home for dinner and TV. When Shirley Gold, who was born in downtown St. Louis and died in Crive Corps, knew it was time to move into the Brookdale Senior Living, she requested her her kids to help her with a garage sale. Before her kids and grandkids arrived, she had priced everything. All paperback books were 25 cents, hardcover $1. Toys, puzzles, games, $3. All jeans, including her husband Harold's, who had just passed away two years earlier, were $3. Purses were 5 to $10. Her daughter-in-law thought that price was especially low, but Shirley reminded her that some of them were not so expensive to start with, and she already had two purses for everyday use. Cassettes and CDs were all one dollar. Harold had a penchant for original film soundtracks and several classical music cassettes. DVDs were two to four dollars. Shirley had also kept Harold's collection of bicentennial knickknacks in a shoebox. The whole collection was ten dollars. There were two landlines, each five dollars. The kitchen table was $25 and another 15 for the chairs. Shirley had strong feelings about the kitchen table, lots of memories, but she knew it was too big for her new Brookdale one bedroom, and she already had picked out a small one with her son Don, who was going to pick it up himself next week. She priced all of the shoes from $3 to $10, which did give Shirley some pause because she often treated herself to finely made shoes, but she never wore them anymore, and they were just collecting dust in the closet. 76 was the same year I worked at the Sea Hatch as a busboy, an upscale seafood restaurant in the Westgate Plaza, a stone's throw from the Creek Corps Lake. No one needs to be reminded just how landlocked Missouri is, after all. <clears throat> Sometimes after my Sea Hatch shift ended, my brother would pick me up and take me downtown to Herbie's. In the 70s, Herbie's was the gay disco in the Central West End the epicenter of St. Louis gay life. My brother would sneak me in and we'd hurry upstairs to the dance floor. For five dollars you could buy a bottle of amyl nitrate, poppers, from the DJ. Everybody had poppers. The dance floor swayed like a fish tank. On this particular night, there was a police raid. The DJ cut off Gloria Gaynor's Never Can't Say Goodbye to announce everybody underage get out. No one left. Everyone started digging through their pop pockets for their Herbie's membership cards. No red. But after that night, Herbie's became stricter and had a doorman and everybody was required to show their Herbie's membership ID. 
The next time I went there, I was refused entry, and my brother had to call me a cab to go home. To see a taxi in Creep Court was highly suspicious, so we agreed to have the driver drop me off several blocks away. A few years later, some of the workers at Herbie's, including the manager, died of AIDS, and they closed down shortly after. Some friends look on from the parking lot next to the falls. Marlboro's bush beer, it could almost be a picnic, save for the quaaludes. <laughs> it is a rotten place for walking these days. The power walker looks down from a ledge onto the gravel lot. Those kids leaning on their cars, stoned, flicking their cigarettes into the gray afternoon, the spectacle of the Creef Court Falls frozen over with its layers of thick white ice like stalactites. This is the year that we all got a little closer to death. Up here, a cop points, a sign nailed to a tree. Here lies the city. And here lies the future, children in it. Even, or especially, the one who says he has something bad in his head and he can't get it out. Tell me what you think of this. There I was at the Creve Court AMC 12, getting comfortable to watch the movie, when this guy sitting next to me stands up and recites the Lord's Prayer. The awkward vibe of sitting next to this preacher guy totally ruined the movie for me. I kept imagining that he would like jump up again and evangelize something or whisper something about his savior, Jesus Christ, into my ear or worse. The movie was Quantum of Solace, which was already super stressful because of the non-stop action. So I didn't need this added layer of suspense. I was leaning away from his seat so hard that I left with a backache. <laughs> when the movie was over, everyone got up to leave and the preacher guy got up and just filed out like everybody else, like nothing had happened. Thank you. Keep it going, keep it going. One more time for both Rodrigo Toscano and Robert Fetterman. Thank you so much again for coming out. I know it's a busy night and there's lots of activities to be had and so it means a lot that you're here and we appreciate you at Splice. If there's really anything else to say, it's that all of these poets' works are for sale here, 10 bucks a book, flat rate. Wow. Great deal, wow is right. <laughs> so, come talk to the poets, come grab a book, go grab a drink, tip your bartender. We'll be here next month. Check out thesplice.org for our next reading. We hope to see you then, and again, thank you.